Dr. Fabian Sandoval is the CEO and research director of the Emerson Clinical Research Institute and has over 25 years of bench-to-bedside research experience. His diversified research career has been in academia, healthcare systems, and the public sector. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Molecular and Cellular Biology from Marymount University and his Doctorate of Medicine from the Autonomous University of Guadalajara, School of Medicine with clerkships through New York Medical College. We discuss the importance of clinical research, his unique path to a career of clinical research, and the logistics of how his research institute runs. We also discuss the ethics of enrolling people who are economically disadvantaged. We finish by discussing how and why private practice physicians can start participating in clinical research. Before opening the doors of his research institute, Dr. Sandoval's research activities have included bench research at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, the NIH's Clinical Center, and Supervisory Research Integrity and Compliance Officer in the Army Human Research Protections Office. Dr. Sandoval is also an Emmy winner for the weekly medical TV show Tu Salud, Tu Familia on Telemundo. He has since started the Emerson Community Clinic in order to support uninsured patients across the D.C. metro area, as well as starting the Emerson Diversity Health Foundation, whose mission is to educate patients and providers in the importance of participating in clinical research and access to care. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Dr. Fabian Sandoval, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Hey, Brad. Thanks for having me. So tell us about your training. It was really interesting when you were telling me about it earlier. You actually didn't do a residency. You went straight into fellowship, which... You know, I'm sure a lot of us would uh, like to be able to do, but in your particular niche, that this uh, I think this works well. So, so how, uh-huh. what is that? How did that work out? And how did you even get the idea that this was something that one could do? <laughs> so yeah, so I, I, you know, I started off as a as a little scientist, even from like high school, right? I was fortunate that I live in Northern Virginia and. NIH was down the street and someone introduced me to NIH and I got the bug of like, this is kind of interesting. So I, I started off as a, as a summer intern, uh, went through the NIH program, which is a great program that, the, you know, all institutes at NIH have to teach kids how to, you know, what the interesting parts of science. So I did that. Then off, after that, continued it through, through undergrad and did my internships there. I actually, my, my internship was the, at NINDS, National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. And that kind of continued my research bug. And after medical school, I knew I wanted to do this. So I went back to NIH and uh, through the whole process, there was an IRDA fellowship program. So this IRDA fellowship program allowed me to continue to do my work that I wanted to do as a scientist, really. So, but I knew bench research was not for me. You know, Brad, when I was in graduate school at UVA, I was doing the bench research, and I was doing bench research at NIH when I was younger, and it was great, you know, learning to do DNA sequencing and Western blots and Northern blots and all that stuff, but I became pretty extroverted, and I knew I wanted to be with patients and people. So I found out that you could actually do research and talk to people. (laughs) And I said, this is awesome. What is this clinical trials thing? And that's kind of how I got the bug and ended up uh, following this career path of clinical trials. So then how did that work when you finished medical school, right? So you did, you, you did your, your medical school training and then you just straight up applied for a fellowship? Yes, I did. I applied for the fellowship because I already knew it existed. And I knew that at the time all of the research institutes had a, a fellowship program. So I was able to just apply for it. And I had a nice strong background coming back to NIH since, you know, I'd been there for so long. And so let's say for some reason you decided that you wanted to just work at a hospital again. Would you, with your training, would you be able to do that or you'd have to go back and do a residency? Oh, I'd probably have to go back and do some residency training. 
Okay, so this is specific towards what you do and how you see patients. So tell us about what it is you do and uh-huh. about the Emerson Clinical Research Institute. So also, Brad, just to, to, to break something back, I, um, in, my, in my prior career paths, did have residents come report to me so that I could teach them clinical trials, right? I don't remember if when you went through your program, you had to have some scholarly activity, right? Oh, yeah, and, I did. Unfortunately, a lot of pipetting that I never yeah. wanted to do ever again. <laughs> and, Sorry, and that's, Diego. That's, that's the problem, you know, that a lot of uh, residents will have this kind of unsatisfying, you know, not very satisfying, gratifying experience in clinical trials because they just want to get rid of it because it's a boring activity um, oh, yeah. because they don't have a good mentor at times to kind of walk them through or say, here, just do a retrospective chart review and get it over with. Well, that was really a waste of your time, right? It was just something to do to check off the box. I would bring residents and teach them how to do real clinical trials and bring them on to real studies, right? With um, not just retrospective chart reviews, but real studies. And that's what I want people to understand, that even if you go through residency program, finish your residency program, and at the end, you should still have the ability to now do regular practice and clinical research at the same time. I opted to go 100% clinical trials. So how does that work when you're seeing patients? Like, uh, like lo- logistically, how do, how do you fill an office, off, like office hours full of patients that are all uh, in different clinical trials? You end up juggling that. How do they find you? How do you find them? Like, uh-huh. how does this work? So how do we bring the patients in? We started a community clinic. So we brought on board, there's practitioners, other providers into the institution that had this interest in research, but really didn't know what to do. Like, oh yeah, research would be interesting, right? So first it's that bug. So with that, that started our foundation of patient base. And then we partnered with a federally qualified health center that had a very large patient pool so that we could see the patients that were available. Then we went and had, we do marketing. We do lots of marketing to tell people about the studies. And then lastly, the third way we bring patients in is through education and outreach. And that's done through our foundation, the Emerson Diversity Health Foundation. So we have a TV show. You know, I'm I'm proud to say we actually were an Emmy award-winning TV show. And we educate people on all kinds of conditions. And then we bring in some of the studies that we're doing into the TV show. Right, So if we were doing a glaucoma study, we'll talk about glaucoma and then we'll tell patients how they could become part of a research patient into a glaucoma study or learn more about it. Um, and then with that at the social media, and we just bring it all together and, and we bring patients to the clinic. You can't just tell us that you're part of an Emmy award-winning television show and not name the show. <laughs> yeah, so it's called Tu Salud, Tu Familia which means your health, your family, right? I started the show about a year and a half ago. Actually, in, in January, it'll be two years. And it was, it's a labor of love through our foundation that we've just, you know, I keep begging and pleading sponsors to see the value in, in this educational aspect of science and research. And yeah, we just, I got some great people together and we did some shows and we submitted one that was worthy and, and we won. We won. We we beat out a bunch of people who had been doing this for a lot longer, and that's pretty cool. Wow! Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> so okay, so basically, this is this is a a clinic that has a research arm to it. It's not like all the patients that roll through have to qualify for studies. It is yes. Basically, nope. it is it is it can stand alone as a clinic. And then no. you also incorporate this element of, of research. Well, funny, most, uh, most practices would do it that way, yes. Would have a, a practice and then bring their patients on that way. I, since I was a researcher from the beginning, I started Emerson Clinical Research Institute just as a standalone research site. So absolutely, all the patients that were coming in were just coming in for research procedures. But I was able to later merge it with the partners that I was establishing 
through the federally qualified health center. And then while that FQHC was full, we decided to start a little community clinic so that these patients that would finish a research study, if they didn't have that same provider, they could stay within our community clinic. But absolutely, ours was backwards. No one, you know, we started just, I started just the research institute just to bring patients into clinical trials because that is what I knew how to do. I didn't know how to do regular daily practice. That wasn't for me, just the research. But I was partnered with the right people so that we could make this kind of a more complete unit. How do you make a living off of this? Because it seems like you'd need a big, because right, because the rest of us are seeing many, many patients a day in order to, right, pay all of the overhead and then have something left to take home. How are you right. able to do that? Because I would imagine you're, you're not, because it's, they're all research oriented patients. You're not able to see that type of volume. No, and that's what's nice. That's the other thing that's nice. So I get paid by the pharma companies. And actually, we are just about to apply for a, for a federal grant for some other work. But yeah, the different major pharma companies or, you know, and mid and small size companies reach out to me now or I, you know, I network, I go to conferences, research conferences and meet other companies that are looking to do trials. And then I tell them, listen, this is my company. And for me, Brad, the one thing that has stood us out from any other site, research site, is that I focus a lot on diversity clinical trials. And my point is we need to make sure all colors, races, ethnic backgrounds participate in clinical trials. Because if we don't, as you're very well aware, our cultures are mixing, so our gene pools are mixing, our population is mixing, and we need to make sure that the medications work on everyone. So that's why I have such a strong patient support and patient following because I bring these studies to patients that otherwise don't have access to Brad. What you may or may not realize is that a lot of underserved patients, a lot of Hispanics that are uninsured don't go to a physician. And what we offer them is that point of care to say, you know, if you have a UTI and you're not going anywhere, you can also come to us because you're going to receive medication, treatment, follow-up, labs, ultrasounds, all at no cost, right? So that's important to them. And then we tell them it's part of a study and that, you know, they get compensated and, and if they don't have a ride, we can give them a ride. So that is very attractive to someone who doesn't have a lot of options. Now, in some of our other studies that we're doing for glaucoma, they are being treated for glaucoma, but it may be an uncomfortable situation. So the current study, it's an implant. So our provider does the implant and the patients are happy because they're doing they're receiving the newest treatment, the newest care, and they don't have to worry about putting eye drops in their eyes every you know few hours. So there's a mix of the type of patients. But to, to sum it about all back up, it really is based on the type of patients that we see, which is just diverse patients. We get paid by the pharma companies. And the best part, Brad, is that I can spend half an hour, 45 minutes with the patient and not have to rush them out in 15-minute increments like we would do in normal practice. And patients love that. So because of that, they come back and they tell their friends and they want to know what other studies they can be involved with. And that's how I make a living. And that's how we get paid. And we get paid well. We get paid well because we do a really good job. So th there's, there's some barriers to some minority groups getting into clinical, tri clinical trials. And one of them is an inherent distrust right. of the medical establishment that many times is completely justified, right? How do you get past that? How, do you, how are you able to enroll some patients that might be hesitant to trust the medical establishment? Because like right now, for instance, you, you said like we're being compensated by pharma uh -huh. and right pharma yeah. has now become this, you know, enemy of the, oh, big pharma, oh, you're under the, right? So, so there's, there's that element, and then there's the inherent distrust of the medical establishment. How, how do you get past that? You know, I, I think it's because we really talk to our patients, not at the patient. I really try and show an extra level of respect for the patient. I humble myself a lot when I'm talking to my patients, and I thank them a lot for even showing up, Right. You know, thank you for coming up. I'm big in showing them respect. They are our VIP patients. I'm honest with them. I tell them, you know, this may or may not work, but 
it may help your child. It may help your grandkids. It may help someone in your family because of your volunteering into the study, right? And then for our Hispanic communities, the other thing I mentioned to them is, well, the other thing I tell patients is you can get out at any time, right? But I also make sure that they know that their information is protected, that we don't care about their legal status. We don't care about the fact that they don't, they do or do not have insurance. We are just here to give them some optional option for care. And then that we put them in touch with other providers so that other follow-ups can can happen once they leave the clinical setting. So it really is talking with the patients, not at the patients. And sometimes we do that, uh, you know, by air as we kind of talk to people because we don't have time. We're like, go, 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 go. Here in clinical trials, we do have time. And in a big practice, you can also make time because you yourself, if you have a study at your clinic, your patients are going to come to you and say, you know, Dr. Brad, this is the condition I have. And you can say, yes, here's your treatment, but we have another option for you. Let me send in my study coordinator or my nurse coordinator, and she's going to tell you about the, the study that we're doing. And then you leave, and then they can take the time to talk to the patient. And then you come in and just clean out with any other follow-up questions that they would have. So as a provider for you, it's not taking up a lot of your time. It's you having the time to open up the door and tell the patient that there is another treatment option that may be of benefit to them and more beneficial and no cost to them. And to you as a provider, you're probably getting labs much faster than you would otherwise. Free images for your patients. You're going to get these lab results. And and if you're actually charging insurance and we want to go into the business side of things, you are going to get reimbursed at a higher rate than the insurance company will probably reimburse you at and faster. You are making a compelling argument for... um... (laughs) <laughs> for including clinical trials as part of even even a private practitioner, right? Because in academics, right, publish or perish. But it, myself as a private practitioner, I'd, I never really saw uh, great motivation other than, you know, the betterment of the house of medicine. Yeah. And, uh, but you're really making a compelling no, argument. No, and there. the other thing, Brad, is that as, as your own practice, now you're providing a service that your competitors, your, you, know, you know, your colleagues slash competitors cannot offer them. Right. So now that's brought you up to the top a little bit when they look at you compared to other providers. Wow, Dr. Brad was able to do this for me. The other guy can't. Right. Um, So you have a leg up on what more you can do for your patients. And yes, and make some money on make some money while you're at it um, to get reimbursed for procedures that you would otherwise not get reimbursed for. It sounds like there are also some potential conflicts of interest. When you're treating, for instance, uninsured patients, right? The more vulnerable in the population and enrolling them in, in the clinical trials. It just Could you go well, into some detail about sure. some ethical yes. issues that, that you have to grapple with? So, um, so the, 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 the main thing with that is that all studies go through an IRB, right? The institutional review boards. And the institutional review boards are there to protect the rights of the patients as well so that there is no coercion or no perception of coercion and that patients have the option, right? In the consent form and in the discussion with the patient, you can say, you know, your treatment option is this. The standard of care is what we can do for you. But there's also the secondary option, which is through clinical trials. And if you say, no, I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to take care of you as a patient. It's okay. But if you say yes, it may help you a little bit better, right? So that's what you can decide to. And to pull you as the provider away, that's why I told you earlier, I'm going to send in my study coordinator. As far as the ethical component of research, you know, all studies go through an IRB, the Institutional Review Board. And the Institutional Review Board takes all of these things into consideration. Who's consenting the patient? How are they doing it? Who gets to sign? What is said? What is not said? Compensation to the patient so it's not a coercive activity. So those are the initial safeguards that, that are set in place. But then it really is up to the site, the provider and the, the coordinator of the study to talk to the patient and, and tell him or her the options that are available. Uh, one of the things that I like to say is like, you can pull the, the investigator, right, that physician away from the room so that the patient doesn't feel uh, kind of forced, right? And, you know, I always say like the hero in white kind of mentality, right? As soon as you're walking with your white lab coat, 
patients will say yes to anything you say, right? So pull that aside and just have a, a, another coordinator come and talk to them. And that's what I do, Brad. That's what I would come in and, and I would say, listen, so I'm the coordinator for this study. Let me talk to you a little bit about what's going on. And then, okay, so I'm going to bring Dr. Brad in and Dr. Brad is going to give you more information if you need it and, you know, participate in this study so we can, you know, get some some new procedures for you or new treatment options for you. So that's how it normally works. So the, the provider's okay, the patient's okay, and it's all done uh, without this kind of uh, feeling like I have to say yes. But you know what, Brad? Sometimes there are no other options, right? If we're talking about oncologies, there's not a lot of options available. So, but it's it's a beautiful thing to do. It really, uh, really helps out the patients quite a bit. Absolutely. Yeah. So actually, if I were to get started, what would be a good way for me to dip my toe in the water? If, if hearing you and your, your compelling argument for involving clinical trials as part of my own private practice. I would say... What is the indication that is most of interest to you, right? And once we find out what is that therapeutic area that's most of interest to you, and you have nowhere else to go because you don't know what to do, I would say to a provider, go to clinicaltrials.gov. It's an old website, but um, it's the, the one that's most useful that has all the information available. Type in the disease that you're looking at that you'd like to do indicate what phase you're interested in doing. I recommend providers start with a phase three, start with phase three studies, right? New providers, phase threes, they're not very complicated. They do well, they pay well, and they're, they're, they're most safe for the patient. Lots of benefit, lower risk. Find out what, what disease, find out the, like I said, disease, phase of the study, and then once to do that search, you can look at the different companies that are doing the studies and then reach out to them. Say, hey, I'm Dr. Brad. I'm an ENT. You know, these are the patients I see. I'd like to see how I can get involved in one of your studies. Then they're going to ask you for training. So while you're doing this lookup, you can uh, go in and get GCP training, good clinical practice training, which is just a, a web-based certificate training that'll take you just a few hours to complete that gives you the background on clinical trials, talks about the principles of research, talks about the Belmont report, you know, educates people on, you know, phase, what phase one, two, and three means, how drugs develop so that you have an understanding, talks about regulations, things like that. I would also recommend that you find a mentor. Look to someone who's currently doing research and say, can you kind of walk me through this? Because this isn't something, Brad, that just because you want to do it means you can or you should do it, right? It's I always say clinical trials is, is a privilege, not a right, because it is a lot of work. So find a mentor, find someone who's doing it and, and kind of talk to them about it. Give me a call. I'll kind of walk you guys through what it is because we need new investigators, Brad. Um, we need new doctors to continue to do clinical trials. And uh, we don't need more podcasters. So if you're looking <laughs> for something extra, something to, to help with the monotony, I recommend not podcasting. Yes, clinical trials. Well, that's very nice of you. But podcasts have their place, my friend. You know, people want to learn, and you're doing it. You're spreading the word that we don't have the time to look up. So where, if people want to learn more about you and what it is that you do, where, where can people find you online? So if they go to, uh, they can Google Emerson Clinical Research Institute, or they can just type ecrinstitute.com. ecrinstitute.com is our website. And our TV show, if you practice your medical Spanish and you learn a little bit more, it's also online as well. It's tusaludtufamilia.com, right? And what, what um, channel would we find that on? Pardon me? What is that? Is that like on a network that we can find? Yes. So it's in, in, if you live in the D.C. metro area, it's on Telemundo, Saturday mornings at 11.30 a.m. And, and our, our reach is local. So we are from Baltimore to Richmond is the, the area that we're able to capture on our TV show. And if not, online, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Actually, the YouTube channel has them, and then our website has all of our shows as well. Incredible. Incredible. Well, Fabian Sandoval, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. I certainly learned a ton, and I'm, uh, I'll be logging on to clinicaltrials.gov to, uh, to see what I'm interested in. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's what we need to do. Look for what's interesting to you. Uh, I think research is a great way to make a little extra income for your practice. 
bring new treatment options to your patients, stand you out in the crowd from other providers and really make a difference and, you know, get away from the monotony. So thanks a lot, Brian. And this is very important for all of us to move forward on. All right. Thank you. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.